Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us in this series of webinars that uh, are being co-hosted by California Campus Compact, Campus Compact of the Mountain West, and Utah Campus Compact. We entered into a partnership uh, beginning several years ago in the Western states to really bring to the fore in a national way and highlight the good work that's being done on campuses across the country um, around civic and community engagement in all sorts of ways. And we're really delighted today to be able to partner with The Facing Project and J.R. Jamison and uh, Kelsey Timmerman. J.R. is also part of the Compact Network, as I'm sure many of you recognize him, his name and his face from Indiana Campus Compact. So he's serving a slightly dual role today. Um, as we move through the, the webinar, you're gonna have lots of opportunity to hear about the Facing Project more broadly, and then some examples from institutions of higher education on this call in the West. Um, please make sure that you look at the bottom of your screen. There's two opportunities um, to be able to participate, even though you are in a listen-only mode right now. One is, as thoughts occur to you and you're um, wanting to put ideas out there to share with the many participants now that are on the webinar and that will be looking at this webinar in the future, please use the chat button and share those thoughts with us. It doesn't have to be questions. It can just be things that are occurring to you or that are drifting through your mind as you hear these presenters um, as we get started. Um, more formally, toward the end of the webinar, the last 10 or 15 minutes, we'll spend in a facilitated question and answer session with the, with the presenters today. So as you think of questions, please log them in the Q&A box. It looks like a little file folder on the bottom of your screen. And as we get to the end, we'll be you know, organizing those questions into buckets of information, and, and we want to make sure we get to as many questions as possible. So put them in there as you think of them, please. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to JR and Kelsey to do an introduction and overview of the Facing Project, and then you'll hear more of these um, awesome campus-based examples. Gentlemen. Hi, everyone. I'm JR Jamison. I'm the co-founder of the Facing Project, and I also, as Stephanie mentioned, serve as the executive director of Indiana Campus Compact. We also have on the call today, Garima Verma and Tiana Ostel, who are representing UCLA. We also have Deborah Romero and Tyler Bedell, who are representing the University of Northern Colorado. And we also have Jenny Allred, who is representing Utah State. And we'll get to them in a little bit, and they'll share some of their, uh, what they're doing with their projects. But before we move forward, I want to turn it over to my co-founder and co-presenter, Kelsey Timmerman. Hey everybody, I'm Kelsey. I am an author by passion and profession. I'm um, a co-founder of The Facing Project. Over the last decade, I've traveled to 80-some countries to meet the people who produce many of the things in our lives we take for granted, from clothing to food, uh, and for books, where am I wearing and where am I eating? So The Facing Project is a uh, 501c3 nonprofit. We're a community storytelling project that connects people through stories to strengthen communities. And I'm sure you're kind of all like, well, what, what does that actually mean? So here's, here's kind of how we explain it. Uh, think about time in your life where you felt um, alone. Like maybe something tragic happened to a loved one or in your own life, a disease, a social issue, where you just kind of felt like you were the only person in the world that was in the circumstance like that. Uh, well, the truth is you're probably surrounded by stories in your community of people who've been sitting right where you were. And if you're able to share your story, and if they're able to share their story, suddenly you don't feel so alone. So the Facing Project through acts of empathy, such as listening, and writing and community theater, we kind of bring those voices uh, to the light and give them a stage to show people that they're not alone as they're facing topics such as poverty, homelessness, hunger, addiction, a whole host of different topics. Mm -hmm. And how that works is our model is a train the trainer approach. And the model pairs writer with storyteller. And the storyteller is the person either facing the issue or topic. So when folks adopt the Facing Project, they work with their community to pick a topic or theme. Um, past projects have included poverty, homelessness, hunger, human trafficking. We've even had projects focused on hope, which is a more positive spin on sometimes really heavy issues and topics. Uh, the writer and storyteller are paired together 
In the instance of when we work with college campuses, oftentimes students serve in those roles as writers. Uh, faculty and staff will come forward sometimes and say, I'd really love to write on this project too, and that works well to have a mix of writers. And we actually encourage campuses to think about those community partners who might want to be writers, as well as writers in the community uh, to include. Writers and storytellers are paired together, and they get to know each other over time well enough that the first draft of the story is written by the writer in the first person in the voice of the storyteller. And then the drafts beyond that before it goes to publication are the writer and storyteller working together on the final product. The final product is in the first person uh, in the voice of the storyteller, but it's created together between writer and storyteller. Um, those stories are all compiled within a book to share throughout the community, share as a resource, and then they're brought to life on stage through community theater. Uh, sometimes actors are community-based, sometimes they're students who are performing these stories. Uh, the books are then used and the stories used to create what we call community conversations about impact and change. Um, what that can look like can be a uh, community read uh, for your community. It could also be conversation circles. Sometimes the theater piece is broken down into smaller units and then taken on the road within your community to be performed at schools and then to create discussions with um, high, high school students about the issue in the community or the topic in the community. Um, some of the stories are often used to influence policy in a community, and sometimes they're used to influence future programming as well. Uh, one of the misconceptions that we, we hear about the Facing Project is that, oh, it's an oral history project. Well, the tradition of it, it is somewhat based on oral history, but it's beyond that. Really, for us, it's about the connection, and that's why we like the idea when we created the model of writer and storyteller coming together and the connection that's created with them to create this product that's then shared with an actor who becomes a part of the story who shares it on stage and then the intersections with the community and then shared through the change model and then shared even even further in the community with high school students policymakers etc so as kelsey mentioned in the beginning it is a it is a piece of connection but it's also acts of empathy listening and community change so now <clears throat> if uh, so we've had about 10 projects and muncie this is where it all started we're, we're in muncie indiana right now and so if I walked to the local cafe a couple blocks away um, I know like half the people in there from having run local facing projects but for me that was not always the case after I graduated college I was basically a global citizen a citizen of everywhere and nowhere and as I traveled around I saw some communities that had really uh, a wealth of community uh, maybe a poverty of resources in some instances but a wealth of community I kind of saw the opposite in my own life so I came back home um, to where I'm, I grew up in the, around this area and um, realized that I had this poverty of community in my own life and I wanted to do something about that. So I started to volunteer for organizations uh, who work with some of the people who live in poverty in um, Muncie, it's a program called the Circles Program. So I got to know these individuals and uh, become friends uh, with people from all walks of life through this organization. And it's a circle of a program that matches up one person who lives in poverty with maybe two, three people who, who don't, and you kind of try to brainstorm a path out for that. You're just kind of there to support that uh, the one person. So it was probably about a year or two I've been volunteering, and then I saw this debate playing out in the local paper. It was around 2010 after the census. And it was a debate on how many people in Muncie live in poverty. And uh, if you count Ball State students, because everybody knows students are poor, right? Or I guess according to the local economists, if you count Ball State students, it's only like, uh, I forget what it was, like 35% of students, 35% uh, of people who live in Muncie live in poverty. But if you don't count Ball State students, it's only like 25%. And to me, this was playing out in the opinion stories and like, you know, the comment threads, and everyone had these real strong opinions about what it looked like to live in poverty. Uh, in Muncie, and what got me was the most important poverty statistic is one. Do you know one single person who lives in poverty in your own community? And until you do, can you really have such a strong opinion? Uh, or can you even work to address the challenges? Um, and that's what I think is happening a lot uh, in, in, our, in our nation right now for, for years is that 
we get so uh, red in the face uh, when we start with our politics or our ideologies and spittle comes out of people's mouth and it just gets ugly, right? And so often we're so passionate about a topic uh, that we don't, but we don't know a single person who's impacted by the topic who lives that life. So um, I was trying to think of a way to kind of uh, bring these stories um, to the community and, and get the community involved in telling these stories. So we recruited, recruited, recruited uh, like 20 some. Uh, it's sorry, 19. you just dropped that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we have 19 writers, 19 storytellers, and then we probably had uh, about half that many or so actors. And we brought this, this uh, Facing Poverty book to light very much in the model that JR mentioned. Uh, so one of the writers I recruited happened to be JR, who I met at a campus compact event. Well, he's bringing me in to speak about uh, one of my books. And he told me that he majored in creative writing. And so I'm like, hey, I need writers. So I voluntold JR. He was going to participate in the facing the very first ever facing project. And, and uh, so yeah. ended up with a pretty good partner on this project overall because I really didn't know what I was doing when it comes to <laughs> running like nationwide like projects. Anyhow, I'll yeah. stop. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, he volunteered me to participate in the first project and it was an amazing experience. I won't go into, um, deep into the story of my storyteller other than, uh, her name was Pat. She's an 80 year old woman and I had to write in her voice and that was extremely challenging, but also extremely rewarding. And Pat and I developed a friendship, uh, from this experience and I saw the book launch for Facing Poverty. You know, hundreds of folks turn out from our community to listen to these stories we told. I looked to the side and I saw Pat smiling, like beaming when her story was performed on stage. And I had a moment thinking like, oh my gosh, this is a story I wrote that's being performed. But then realizing this is a story that Pat had lived. And that was a real game changer for me. And I saw that over and over 19 times. I also saw our mayor come up to us afterward and say, these stories are so important. I wanna think about how these fit into our monthly action plan, uh, which in many ways is an organization that focuses on the strategic plan of where our community is headed in the next uh, 10 years. So I went to Kelsey and I said, I don't think the magic should end here. I think there are other stories in our communities um, that need to be told. And we could use this model to tell those. And then we started toying with the idea of like, well, how can we get other people on board so that it is more than just the two of us, but a connection. So we started putting together a toolkit and we reached out to five individuals we had developed relationships with and said, we would love for you to pilot the facing project with us and to use the toolkit we put together and we'll work with you to get this going but we want to see if the magic just exists in our community if there's something unique about us or if this also could exist elsewhere so we worked with large metropolitan cities like Atlanta Georgia we worked with smaller rural cities uh, we worked with colleges and universities. We worked with nonprofits only. And then we also worked with individuals who are community activists, but not necessarily connected to one specific organization. We tested the model out, learned from those individuals, tweaked the model into what it is today. And then about three years ago, um, we said that we were willing to work with any nonprofit higher education, others who would like to work with us to use this model to help tell stories in their own communities. Uh, within the first year to two years, we grew from just five communities to about 30 communities across the country. And then we developed a partnership um, through Campus Compact last year where state offices were able to give away facing projects to some of their member campuses. Um, that made us, uh, our reach grow tremendously. We now are uh, working with about 75 different communities across the country, most of those college campuses, um, on getting this model moving out, getting students in their communities, collecting the narratives, working with, um, community partners and community members to tell their stories and bring them to life on stage to help think about community action and change. Um, I, the way that we also work with communities, in case you're wondering, and we'll come back to this at the end, um, we do charge $1,000, which <coughs> is a discounted rate. Um, that is for Campus Compact members. It's a 35% discounted rate, so we charge $1,000 for a year. 
and that provides individuals with our toolkit which is the it's about a hundred and fifty page toolkit that guides you through your entire project from A to Z uh, it also has templates in there it has sample release forms as recruitment materials and such we also provide you with what is called a facing project coach and that is a volunteer role with our organization they're trained on our model and they're assigned to uh, your project lead and they work with you throughout the year walking you through the toolkit They're available for questions brainstorming, etc. We also have a team of editors So as your stories are coming in our team will look at your stories and help provide feedback um, copy edits content edits and such uh, We also build a website that is unique for each community So you determine what you want the URL to be for that website it's a place where your stories can be housed. It's a neutral area that can be shared among campus and community and writers and storytellers for the promotion of your project to get the word out. Um, we also have a fundraising platform that you can use. Um, it is unique for your project. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer campaign that can help you raise funds around your project if you choose to, to do that. What else am I leaving off? Uh, seems like an awful lot. <laughs> yeah. um, so those are the services that we provide for you throughout that entire year. And like I mentioned, it is $1,000 um, to do that, but you receive everything that I just mentioned. Um, instead of being a talking head, I want to turn it over now to Garima Verma and Tiana Austin. Uh, Garima and Tiana, we met about three years ago, two and a half years ago, at the Impact National Conference. Uh, and Garima at that time was a student at UCLA, as was Tiana, and they adopted the Facing Project model and took it back to their campus, uh, where UCA, UCLA now has a Facing Project chapter on their campus that is completely student-led. So I want to turn it over to them to talk a little bit about their project getting started, what that looked like, and such. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so like I said, so like uh, I said my name uh, is Grima, and I am no longer a UCLA student, but I was at the time. Um, and Tiana is still at UCLA. She is sharing her screen. Are you able to see it? I am trying to share my screen. <laughs> Let's see. Well. Well, in general, we can uh, talk a little bit just about how we got involved with the Facing Project. So UCLA sends a congregation of students to the IMPACT conference, like they were saying, which is pretty much just a gathering of a bunch of different community service organizations from across the country. And they had a keynote speech, and I remember just kind of sitting there and thinking, like, this would be really, really great for, for UCLA. At the time, we were having a lot of campus climate issues there was a lot of kind of unrest amongst the students who had different opinions about different things and there was a lot of just fighting on campus and the campus climate was really negative and so hearing them talk made me feel like oh this is a great way for people to understand each other telling each other like people's stories is a great way for people to connect so that's kind of how we brought that um, along to our campus we met them and talked to them and just kind of started it and we were part of an organization called the community service commission on our campus which is pretty much an organization that houses many many projects um, and many service organizations and it's entirely student run and we thought that that would be a great place to start the facing project and kind of help it grow from the ground up on our campus especially since there hadn't really been many college uh, phasing projects before then um, and Tiana can talk a little bit about kind of just starting it up. Yeah. Um, so hi, I'm Tiana. Um, I'm still at UCLA. I'm a senior, um, and I helped start the Phasing Project three years ago at UCLA. Um, Agreement. I kind of made this short presentation, just going over all the things like why the Phasing Project, how it came to be, all that kind of stuff, just outlining kind of its journey at UCLA and where it is now. Okay, so um, first off, Grima will let you know maybe a little bit why we started the Facing Project. So just, just like I was saying, we just had a lot of climate issues and we really felt like, you know, a lot of people 
can deny all the statistics that people are putting out there, but you can't really deny people's experiences and people's stories. So we thought that bringing students together, especially in a broad topic, our first year our topic was facing access to higher education. So we felt that that was a broad enough topic where you know, everybody at UCLA has faced some sort of difficulty in accessing higher education, and they had all different types of experiences. So we thought that that would be a good place to start, just because it's a broad enough topic where students can relate to each other, even if they feel like other things are not similar. Yeah, so um, we were the first student-run Facing Project chapter, um, so we were entirely student-run. We really believe in the power of students telling the, uh, other, each other's stories. Uh, so basically at UCLA, we have something called the Community Service Commission. We're a branch of student government, which uh, handles community service at UCLA. We are the largest completely run uh, community service organization in the country. Um, basically, we have a... Uh, Kind of a staff in different projects um, and we connect students back to student organizations that address the issue so our first uh and inaugural uh facing project was actually facing access to higher education yeah so kind of going over this it was facing access to higher education before it went to facing mental health and then it was facing out um, which had to do with lgbtq uh, issues so different things we worked on um we wanted uh topics that were broad and relatable because we wanted to make sure that in our first year we can access um, a whole bunch of people's stories and build that network so we can carry on to future years. Um, we also, in addition to, for our meetings, did router workshops to train students on how to write creatively. So, you know, when you're listening to a story, how are you able to create a story that really portrays um, kind of that person's life and how are you um, working together with someone to build that cohesive story? Um, we did things like uh, sensitivity workshops and we also did things like um, different, uh, you know, 15 minute writing exercises that teach you like how do you get the most out of your writing. In addition to that, we also did face-to-face -face recruiting, which we felt was the most successful way of finding writers and storytellers, was actually going out to our own personal networks and saying, you know, this is an amazing project that I'm being a part of, and I'd love for you to be a part of this too. Different growing pains that we identified were actually identifying storytellers the hardest part actually wasn't finding people to take part in this project on the writer side, it was actually on the storyteller side. And it wasn't that people weren't willing to um, share their stories, it was actually kind of funny is that once people found out they actually wanted to be more involved and become writers, so it was almost hard finding people who didn't want to be as involved. Um, but we eventually identified a huge uh, group of storytellers which we kind of um, to go from quarter to quarter. So we had uh, the first year about 15 writers and 15 storytellers and then we took some of the excess storytellers we had from our first quarter, and then we actually transferred over to the winter quarter. So we were always constantly on a rolling basis for storytellers. Um, we also kind of had some growing pains of building a strong team and finding funding. I think those were also two very difficult issues. Um, you know, as when you start any nonprofit or when you start any student group, it's always hard to find your base. Um, and then once you find your base, it's much easier to kind of expand from there and build your network. And just one of the things that we found to be really important, especially with sensitive topics like mental health, is doing that sensitivity training that Tiana mentioned, bringing in mental health professionals, for instance, uh, to help the writers understand what the best way to approach the storyteller's story is and to make sure that, you know, they're not triggering them, they're not offending them, making sure that it's a safe space that the storytellers can tell their stories so that it is a more productive um, phasing project experience for them. Yeah, we also reach out to a lot of student groups whose uh, missions aligned with ours. So for example, like Facing Mental Health, we reached out to an organization, a student run organization that deals a lot with mental health um, and building awareness campaigns around that. And that's where we found a lot of success in finding storytellers because people who tend to be involved are very passionate about the issues and very willing to share their stories. All right, um, so kind of a little bit of the project structure. Um, so it started as part of CSE, as Grima was saying earlier, um, but now it's part of its own group. Um, so we start off with like 10 to 15 writers. It's a little bigger now. Um, I think it's right around 20. Um, and then 15 to 20 storytellers every 10 weeks. Um, the writers typically will write two to three stories a year. Um, and then we had four editors to help edit those stories from the writers, two artistic coordinators to kind of go over the design for the book at the end of the year. 
and then an editor-in-chief who takes care of a lot of the administrative issues. Um, it also helps plan all the big campaigns at the very end of the year, and also kind of a big release party in which we had uh, you know, spoken word, and we were reading the stories and acting, and all those things that JR and Kelsey were saying before. And this structure worked for us just because we felt like it covered kind of all the different bases that we needed to cover. We had people working with the different storytellers. So each of the editors was assigned to certain storytellers and writers. Um, and the artistic coordinators were able to kind of gather the design of the book and um, plan out the events. And like we were saying before, we are really proud of the fact that the organization started out within a larger organization at UCLA um, just to kind of help it you know, build up, but now it's its own group on campus, which is a difficult thing to do at UCLA with so many students and so much going on. So we're really excited that, that it was able to grow that much. Yeah, um, another thing is that for the writer storyteller, so basically um, what I did in the very beginning is that I had storytellers kind of fill out a Google form and kind of say like a short summary of their story. Um, and then I helped, um, uh, I basically gave the writers like different people's story, like very short excerpts, like two to three sentences. Um, and I, you know, blanked out people's names for privacy. And then I had writers kind of prep the stories of the issues that they're specifically interested in because we had such a broad topic. Um, and then once the writers were assigned to storytellers and that was matched by the editor in chief, um, then they would meet with their storytellers at least four to five times or until they actually felt comfortable with their story. Um, and then that was an ongoing process to kind of meet with them on more of a weekly basis to make sure the story was in line um, with what the storytellers wanted to tell. And another thing that we really enjoyed doing was partnering with organizations and especially student organizations on campus that worked with that specific issue. So a lot of the organizations on campus at UCLA deal with some aspect of accessing higher education. So we were able to kind of tell these people stories, show them all of these different experiences and issues that people face accessing higher education, and then connect them to organizations that help combat that. So different um, organizations that work with immigrant students that help with English language learning, um, that help with different types of communities, just so people are seeing the issue and they're also able to help out with it for future generations. Yeah, and then this page is just, um, it's a few flyers that we made for Facebook to kind of help recruit people. Um, you can see it's like uh, facing access to higher education, facing mental health, and also facing out. Um, and so since we are mainly uh, student-based and student-run, um, we had a lot of students, you know, change their cover photos and profile pictures and reach out over Facebook events. And that was very successful in getting people their actual final launch. Especially in the first year when, like Tiana was saying, we're spreading a lot through our own networks, we were able to get, uh, you know, the hundreds of people that are in our organization already to help spread the word about the Facing Project on campus. And, you know, that way we were able to reach more and more people through our own channels and those people are more likely to be involved. Um, and now it's more of an organization that can exist on its own on campus. Yeah, so kind of going over some of the impact. Um, so over the past three years, we've collected over 100 stories. Um, some of them have been published online and then others have been published in our book. Um, over 50 have been actually published in the books that we have at the end of the year. Um, many of the storytellers joined Facing Project as writers um, and joined service organizations afterwards. Um, one kind of difficult thing about UCLA is that it's hard to get plugged into the service community, but once you do, people tend to kind of spread out and join as many as they can. Um, but we were lucky enough to have a lot of storytellers who became interested in the project and came back as writers the next year. Um, we also tried to increase the dialogue and uh, cultivate relationships between UCLA students. Um, we found that a lot of storytellers and writers actually became friends after this project, which was something that was really amazing. Um, and we try to help students understand the issues and connect them to the resources. Um, and yeah, because as Green was saying before, like Facing Project is now its own standalone student organization. That's something that we're very proud of because it basically became um, kind of a full-fledged student org and is now reaching out and is running very strongly. And we're always happy to see, um, like we were talking about before, at the end of the year, we kind of created all the stories with an event that was able to express the different stories. And even just the first year, we really could see the impact on the people who were actually present at the event. They were really moved by a lot of the stories that they heard. And we also had little stations where people could kind of express themselves, even if they weren't 
in the um, project throughout the year. So we just had like a sticky note wall where people can kind of express their own issues that they dealt with, accessing our education and kind of art expression corners. And we really saw that mean a lot to the students that were actually involved. And we were happy to see that they were able to connect with service organizations to help combat that issue in the future. Yeah, during our release week at the very end of the year, um, as Grima was saying, we actually had a canvassing project. Um, it was basically uh, something I came up with like that morning, but basically I just put a giant roll of butcher paper on one of our main walkways on campus. And on one side, I put like what was a barrier that you uh, faced accessing higher education or what was like a support system that you relied on to get access to higher education. And it was amazing. A lot of the stories that people shared with complete strangers that were so impactful and were so personal to them. Um, and then we basically took this wall with, I would say about 200 to 250 sticky notes um, and had it up at our actual release night. Cause we wanted to show that while the stories, like there were certain stories in the book, like there's stories all around us and we should be listening to understand deep complex issues. So we just wanted to share a little bit of how we designed our very first book. Of course, this was a very big like learning and growing experience for us, but we tried to get creative with it as much as possible. Um, we did have a lot of storytellers who wanted to remain anonymous or, you know, didn't necessarily want pictures of themselves in the books like, like there are in other ones. So we kind of tried to find other ways to represent the different things that were going on in their stories through graphics, any other kind of visual um, structural things, just to make it really creative and interesting um, and expressive for everyone that was reading it. Yeah, so the very end, the very end of the PDF was it was about I believe around 60 65 pages um, and each page was actually formatted differently. Um, it was something that was kind of worked with the uh, writer and the storyteller. They gave the artistic coordinator ideas and the artistic coordinator and the editor in chief worked together to design a lot of these pages. Um, in addition to the actual stories, we actually asked for art submissions from the community that had to do with the issue. Um, so it was like different art pieces, but also different poetry and spoken word pieces. And we read some of those pieces from the book at our actual launch. Yeah, and so this is an example of um, a story that we read. Um, and I will read the first paragraph. <laughs> So um, the first paragraph is, the Alps are not what they seem. The calm bareness of the snow uh, belies the treacherous terrain that devours but the most seasoned skiers. On its broad gleaming slopes, your heart rate rings in your ears as you make frantic parallel cuts with your skis. And for a tense split second, your field of vision narrows to a focal point in the distance. But I am no adrenaline junkie. I don't live to subdue nature just to get a rise. Instead, what I really like about the outdoors is the proximity to the bare wilderness. Take camping in the Alps, for instance. It forces you to rely on the most fundamental survival skills, and you are confronted by your own insignificance. Away from day-to-day -day trivialities, this is life at its most stripped down, distilled by the biting alpine winds and an unfiltered blazing sun. Um, so as an example of one of the stories, um, basically, this was a transfer student um, when he came over to America for college, and it was kind of his journey over to uh, UCLA and just kind of the pressures of being at UCLA and we used a lot of stories and a lot of hobbies to kind of explain someone's character while also kind of saying the struggles they're going through because you want to imagine people as complex and you know you have the struggles you go through but you also have you know how are you seeing them as like a uh, three-dimensional character. Yeah, so we were just able to showcase, you know, his experiences coming from a different country, the kind of cultural differences in education, and how he faced those differences at UCLA. So, yeah, thank you for hearing about our story. <laughs> That's it for us. Let's see. There we go. Karima and Tiana, I really appreciate oh, that. I stopped my we're going to move now to Deborah Romero and Tyler Bedell at the University of Northern Colorado. And their experience is more course-based, so they'll share more about what the Facing Project has looked like there. Great, thank you so much. Can you see our screen, first and foremost? Can you hear us? <laughs> Maybe not. Can you hear us? Oh, one second. Um, somebody. 
can you hear us? Are you still there? Yes, you're good. You're good. Okay. All right. Yep. Sorry. We were doing the silent thumbs up. You're oh, good. Well, we can't see video. Remember, well, Stephanie, you missed that bit. We can't see you guys, so we don't know. Gotcha. Is you're that? all good. Sorry. Okay, we will start again. <laughs> Thank you so much and thank you to Garima and Tiana for sharing what's um, clearly a um, well-established project now at UCLA. Congratulations to all of you and the other students. You're, you're making great headways there. Well, to everybody else on the webinar, on the call, um, I want to start by thanking JR and Kelsey uh, for this invitation to share what we're doing here at the University of Northern Colorado and to Piper for all her technical support and to Stephanie and our partners in crime at Campus Compact for getting us involved in this in the first place. Um, my name is Deborah Romero. I am a professor of education and the inaugural director of engagement at the University of Northern Colorado. This is my 11th year here and I have really watched both our institution and our uh, small community that I'll talk a little bit about in a moment grow and change significantly over these recent years. I just want to acknowledge before we move through our presentation uh, that I'm here with my graduate assistant, soon to graduate um, colleague, uh, Tyler Bedell. You'll hear from him in a minute. And also as well to recognize our faculty colleague in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Northern Colorado, Trish Jolly. She has been an advocate and a supporter and as we'll share with you, is the faculty that in collaboration with our Office of Engagement is rolling out this project with uh, two of her classes here on campus. So let me give you just a, a little bit of background uh, to the University of Northern Colorado and the Greeley context, context. We're about an hour north out of Denver metropolitan area in what some might call a semi-rural region of uh, Colorado. Our city was founded back in 1869 as Union Colony. And um, if you look up its origins and uh, beginning times, it was called an experimental utopian society. So no pressure there for Greeley to develop in uh, certain directions. It was later renamed though uh, to the city of Greeley after the original founder. Our institution, which is a four-year public college, um, has undergone several different name changes, but originated now over 125 years ago, uh, founded by community members back at that time to provide teacher training and teachers for this uh, developing area and region. And today, University of Northern Colorado is one of the largest teacher preparation colleges in the state. And more than half of the teachers uh, in our K-12 schools graduate from UNC. So teaching and learning is very much a part of what we do, um, both as an institution and myself professionally with a range of other programs. But enough about that. Um, our decision to undertake a facing project for for me it was um, an easy draw and as I suggest there it was kind of this confluence of different factors and contexts coming together I consider myself to be um, an engaged scholar an engaged academic I have uh, a history of research and partnerships through my teacher preparation education working with pre-service English second language teachers and teachers in our local high schools hosting and developing kind of a, a very small scale similar authoring project. So that was kind of one piece that I thought, well, this sounds like something that I'm interested in. I recognize the power of stories to bring change with published immigrant and refugee stories and watched both the transformation in adolescent youth when they are repositioned as uh, storytellers whose voice suddenly becomes heard. Students who have otherwise been quiet and unnoticed in a classroom are now authors reading their stories um, in our campus library. That's such a powerful moment. Um, but also from an institutional perspective and this desire to support engaged learning on our campus and recognizing the inherent challenges that are entailed with this work from a faculty perspective. 
So in my seat and through my role as Director of the Office of Engagement um, and as a recently classified 2015 Carnegie Engaged Campus, we have an institutional plan where we are working on different aspects of community engagement, but particularly as community engagement connects to support students' learning and development, but from their academic, from their curricular perspective. Um, so that was kind of a, a key piece there, looking at how this project could provide opportunities within students' curricula development. We are also simultaneously involved, uh, again, thanks to Campus Compact, and one day I'll say no to one of the invitations they send us, but uh, in what we are calling regionally a civic health and equity initiative. So institutionally, we're partnering with colleagues from University of Denver, CSU, and University of Colorado to design assessment instruments to look at university impact in communities. This is more of a survey approach, gathering primarily quantitative data, because that project came around literally a week or so before this facing project invitation came across our desk. This just seemed to be a, another opportunity to enrich whatever quantitative data we might be gathering through the survey approach to working with community partners. So really it was this kind of very rich moment where several different um, opportunities just all came together. So how are we thinking about undertaking um, our facing project on our campus? We decided when we uh, initially looked at the call and then we um, had some exchanges with Kelsey and JR, who I can only speak most highly of if anybody is thinking about undertaking this work. Uh, these are your two cheerleaders and uh, champions who will steer you through um, whatever your journey might be. Um, we reflected and thought that the two semester timeline would be most appropriate and then we put out a campus call for participation if you see on some of the other slides at unc we've very broadly and deliberately called our facing project uh, version the theme we chose was facing change uh, change seems to be something that is happening all around us and can take on many different uh, forms for both individuals and for communities and uh, students and institutions likewise. So we felt that thinking about issues of civic health and reflections there but under the big umbrella of change would provide a um, wide enough framework for faculty from potentially any disciplinary area who might be interested in partnering with us to come on board. So uh, just a little bit before the beginning of our semester, we put out a call to faculty and programs, really giving them the kind of the snapshot, here's this project. Um, I teach classes, but I didn't want this to be about one of my classes. We wanted it to um, have a broader impact on our campus. And we were approached by several faculty. Um, we did some brainstorming and walked through what the opportunities were and what it could look like. And ultimately, it uh, was a faculty member, Trish, as I mentioned at the beginning, who was teaching an upper level 350 cultural anthropology field methods course, who um, together with us, we decided that this would be the best fit. Uh, Trish is a faculty who has taught community engaged learning before. You'll see in a minute a, a photo from part of what they did uh, related to that course in the fall. But she's she's faculty who's ambitious, I'm going to say, and I don't think she'd mind, and Tyler can jump in. She's not afraid to take on a challenge, and I think that's an important part of doing this work when it ties into curricular efforts. But for her, knowing that she had the support of our office and a graduate assistant and that this was, I think, in many ways connected to something bigger than our institution and our university, and that's the National Facing Project, those were, if you want, kind of layers of structure and support that makes the whole thing seem more manageable. Um, so we rolled out the training with them in the fall, we reviewed the curriculum, um, and we worked to kind of organize the students, and we're sharing a little bit how we called on community for storytellers. In this current semester, so we gathered stories during the fall, and now this semester, and this was another reason why um, we decided to go with this course, there's a uh, capstone course, Community Storytelling, again, Anthropology, and it's a variable title, but we deliberately 
tight the title right into uh, our project writing for change and this is now many of the students from the fall semester but also some new students working in teams to launch edit design publish do everything that brings this project to fruition and um, increase public awareness so I think Tyler's going to talk just briefly about the groups. Yeah, as Deborah mentioned, we do have five teams that students have been self-selected to participate in. Um, as you can see them there on the screen, editing and book publishing, illustration, event planning, fundraising, and web design. And this has allowed students to have a timeline that oper also operates in a larger timeline of the class and obviously the event and book publishing, um, and to realize the goals within goals that need to be established and um, carried out. Um, another kind of, again, layer or slice to this project that both institutionally and um, from my own perspective we were really interested in is tying this into our understanding of what community engaged learning means for students on our campus. We have, again, um, high level uh, quantifiable data that shows that 50% uh, or more of our students report some community engaged learning experience by the time they graduate on our campus. And we can also uh, look at that data and see that it does have an impact uh, with relation to other indicators such as student sense of belonging, their desire to pursue graduate studies, their understanding of uh, community-based issues. But we don't have in-depth qualitative if you want stories from students about what this means as they're going through these experiences so our office uh, wrote an irb that's our institutional review board and we have a research permission and we're working with the faculty and students in this first cohort class to conduct pre-post surveys and gather information from reflective journals and hopefully somewhere in there um, some focus groups to try and get a better sense of what does it mean to engage in community-based learning experiences and perhaps we'll have some more specific things about particularly this project, the Facing Project and the power of stories there. Here uh, on the right you see two photos that were taken during some fundraising events that our students put on, uh, selling flowers and bouquets of chocolate suckers during Valentine's Day. This is a really interesting event. Um, so, as Deborah alluded to earlier, the storytellers that our students interviewed came from our network of community partners. Uh, this included community providers, whether that's health care, education, or produce, uh, refugees and immigrants, as our city and community has a large resettlement population, and as well as new and long-term residents of Green. Uh, themes that came from these or emerged from these interviews were stories of personal change, community growth and community change, as well as the change that occurs with resettlement, whether it is personal or family. For outcomes, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, for outcomes, we really wanted to connect students uh, with the community, but also offer that as an educational opportunity. Some, um, excuse me, share some on this little story with authenticity and integrity. That was a big piece that the toolkit, toolkit touched on with JR and Kelsey, as well as uh, community-engaged work around event planning, fundraising, and design. A lot of students in this class had had the opportunity to do a similar event, but it was on campus, so this is allowing the extra component of community members to come in. And lastly, understand the importance of symbols. That's one thing that we tied back to our anthropology coursework in terms of how does this play out in the larger context. For the Greeley community, we really wanted to raise awareness of the issues in the community, uh, foster empathy and understanding coming from the institution. We think that meant uh, a lot to, to our community, as well as be a potential vehicle to enact community change and enhance visibility of that community change. And I guess ultimately, kind of to pull it all together, we are hoping um, that this will perhaps provide us with a model for future engagement projects and maybe even subsequent iterations of facing projects here on our campus. 
Um, we're also, um, I am and Tyler too, as we work closely with the faculty member concerned, you know, gathering feedback from her about logistical challenges, what's working, uh, what we could do to still further improve this and consider how this might be adapted or adjusted uh, in the future. So we are excited to be here to learn from all of you and to share our experiences so far. And we look forward to sharing a book and hopefully something on the website uh, before the end of this semester. So thanks to everybody and we are open to questions. Thank you so much, Deborah and Tyler. That was great. Uh, we're going to move now to Jenny Allred, who is at Utah State. Um, and then as Stephanie mentioned in the beginning, Kelsey and I will come back on and then we'll open it up for questions for, for anyone on the panel. <clears throat> Jenny, are you there? I don't see her listed on there, JR, so you may want to, um, unless she speaks up, go ahead and, and continue with your part maybe, and then we can, I, we can, I'll jump in for Q&A. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So you heard a little bit about the project at UCLA and the project at University of Northern Colorado and some of the impacts that they have seen so far. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have about 75 different communities we're working with across the country. So we're starting to begin to see what the impact beyond the book launches looks like. To give you an example of a few of those, Elena, Georgia, which was one of our original five pilots, uh, did facing sex trafficking back in 2014. Today is actually the three year anniversary of their book launch and theatrical event. Um, since that time, they created a partnership with the Atlanta Hartsville Jackson International Airport, and they have a kiosk in the Delta Domestic Terminal where travelers passing through can put headphones on and listen to the recorded stories from their project, and you can pick up information to learn more about domestic human and sex trafficking. What do you do if you think you spot human or sex trafficking while you're traveling? How do you contact authorities and such? Um, they also then reached out to the congregations in the Atlanta um, area that included uh, mosques, synagogues, uh, churches. They recreated the theater event for each of those entities. And then together uh, through interfaith dialogue, they began to talk about how they can change policy in Elena, Georgia around um, sex workers and them being arrested. What they found through the stories uh, and then further research that they did that then became a mixed methods approach was that most of the women and men were forced into prostitution as teenagers. Um, and they're always the ones who are convicted of those crimes when they're arrested and not necessarily the people who buy and sell those individuals each day. So they're using those stories to educate uh, authorities in Atlanta and also look how they can help change some policies when it comes to um, sex workers and laws in Atlanta, Georgia. So that's one example. Here in our home state of Indiana, Facing Autism was released three years ago as well. And now we're seeing that book used with the Indiana State Police when they train new officers for sensitivity training around disabilities. So that's a huge plus to see the book used in that capacity. We also know in our own state in Fort Wayne, Indiana, when Facing Homelessness was launched about three years ago, um, that also helped put together a sleeping bag initiative for the homeless. So there was an, an individual who attended that theatrical uh, book launch and she was in a sewing circle. She reached out to the nonprofits involved in that project afterward and said, how can my sewing circle best help? There was a need to provide sleeping bags for individuals who don't seek shelters during inclement weather. So then she and her sewing circle partners began creating sleeping bags for the homeless in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So that was really awesome to see uh, stories become sleeping bags, we like to say. Uh, in that instance. We've also seen the stories be used by the nonprofit partners to help leverage funds. 
for their organization. So it's an awareness raising piece, but it's also an opportunity for them to use the publication with funders to talk about their work uh, and to receive support. We've seen um, one nonprofit be selected for a fundraiser where they received $75,000 and of it because of their facing project. Uh, beyond those tangible pieces, just the connections we've seen have been really great. And so, as you heard uh, Garima and Tiana mention uh, earlier, it's not uncommon for writers and storytellers to develop relationships and friendships that last over time. It's also not uncommon for uh, storytellers, if they wish to not be anonymous, for individuals to reach out the, to them to say, hey, I'm facing the same issue or, or um, what have you, and they create a connection that way. Um, because in our hometown, you know, we're working with folks across the country, it's important for us to continue to lead facing projects in our own community. And here in our own town, I mean, we have seen the project grow tremendously. We see the connections that have been created. Um, almost everyone I know now has told their story in some iteration of the facing project, um, including our mayor, who has shared his story in a couple of different facing projects. Um, your wife shared, Kelsey's wife shared her story in Facing Autism, and she was not anonymous in the book, and she still gets mothers who reach out to her uh, all the time, who say, your story about your son really resonated with me, can we meet for coffee, right? And so that's what it's all about. It's about the community connections, um, creating those connections with people you may not otherwise create a connection with, so that's really the community piece. Then it's also looking at the impact of how do these stories help create those kiosk type things like in Atlanta, Georgia? How do they help shift policy like in Atlanta, Georgia? How do they help with training like here in Indiana with the state police and so on? And then from the student development piece, getting students out in their community in this way, we've heard from multiple institutions to say this is really a different type of community engagement experience that our students haven't had before. Because not only are we getting at them out in the community, which we've done, we're actually asking them to carry the weight of someone's story and help be that vessel with them to get their story out to a broader audience. And that's a different form of engagement. Uh, we're working with um, an assessment professional here in our community now. We've just begun a relationship with her that we want to begin looking broadly at all the facing projects happening across the country to begin to look at that deeper impact because we're now three, four years out from when uh, these first started and we continue to grow. Um, and rather than the anecdotal evidence, the tangibles that I've been able to share with you, we really want to begin to look at um, the deep impact of this and be able to measure that. And so we're working with an assessment professional right now who is developing an instrument for us that we'll be able to share with all of the Facing Project communities that will be good for them because they can use in their communities to look at their own individual stats, but then we'll be able to look at the broader picture across the country and begin to look at how stories really are creating community change. Cool. So to follow up with a little something that Deborah said, I'm gonna have Jr. model his shirt. Oh, God. I thought you were asking me to move out of the Can you model his shirt? We'll write for change. <laughs> so um, like Deborah, Deborah's course. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so you know, we, the quantitative is really important to us as well, but we're really coming at it from a qualitative perspective. Uh, and there's a lot of power in stories, and we know there's a lot of people just from. You know, hearing feedback from communities and participating in these projects ourselves that people aren't heard and they need to have their stories heard and we need to have the empathy and compassion to listen to them and also something I think that we both learned and that communities are finding is how how people how much power there is in your own individual stories uh, to help make you know, if you're brave enough to share it like my wife sharing for facing autism who still gets people calling her to this day I have a young son who we think maybe or may not be on the spectrum, like, what should I do, you know, and she's able to help give them that guidance because she was brave enough to, to share it. So we really believe that um, stories are the basic building blocks of community, and it takes a thousand voices to tell a single story. So that's why we're so excited about the Facing Project spreading across the country, about it, our, our partnership with the Campus Compacts. Um, so I, I think we're ready to take some questions. If you all have any questions, you can email us. 
if you think of something later, uh, howdy at facingproject.com. That goes to both of us. That's mm -hmm. why it's howdy. And plus, we're from Indiana. <laughs> so, like, you know, home of Woody. I, I, was, I don't know if Indiana can claim howdy, but well, I'm, I'm a Texan, so it's okay. Right, yeah. We can debate the mayor. Those later. Uh, um, so, the call it howdy, too, here in Indiana. <laughs> um, thank you all very much. And we're going to sort of organizing questions from a more macro level and then drill down to the campus level. So for you two, Kelsey and JR, um, there's a question around if the facing project has ever been implemented or taken on by a community college and what are the differences, if so, that you've seen at the community college level? Yeah, so we have several projects that have been led by community colleges right now. Actually, a really great example is Mott Community College in Flint, Michigan, is working on a project. They just received really great news coverage um, from the Flint Nightly News on their project. Uh, that one is course-based, but student-driven and led by the students in the course. The interesting thing is I've not really seen a difference uh, between four-year institutions and community colleges in their capacities and or efforts to lead a facing project. So there is no significant difference that we've been able to monitor um, to that end. I find sometimes as I'm visiting community colleges for my, for my books or for the facing project, is often the classroom will have uh, more diversity of age sometimes as well. So depending on what facing project you're doing, it's, it could almost be an audience, a, a group of people that has um, a more diverse reach into the community um, and maybe engaged al already some in those, in those avenues or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, already volunteering with some of these organizations. Yeah. I know wearing my campus compact hat too, we get the question often, uh, well, in our community colleges, are we asking, in many cases, for our students to serve the populations from which they come from, which may not always happen in four-year institutions. But I will tell you that we have seen in facing projects, four-year private institutions take on homelessness projects where they have homeless students on their campuses who are telling their stories. Um, so, you know, some of the topics faced in facing projects cut across institutional types. Um, and cut across communities. And so if that is a concern that individuals have, I would not worry about that. I often say, depending on the topic, you might want to include student stories. You may want to look at collecting stories from the community, but also student stories, because that helps bridge the town now gown divide as well when you show that everyone in this community has faced this topic in some way. Great, thank you. Speaking of that, going on, on the topic of um, the themes for different projects, are there any stories or topics that are off limits completely? And I don't know if this has come up at the campus level, especially for like at UCLA, where you've had years or multiple projects, or for you all at the home base, is there anything off limits? We've seen the most, <clears throat> the most challenging project then to date was uh, Washington Lee University is facing sexual violence. And that was a tough one. Uh, there were lawyers involved in that topic that were read every single story. Uh, the words dorm or campus were not allowed to be included. This was right after um, uh, the Virginia Rolling Stone article and all that stuff too. So this was kind of the climate this was taking place in. And they actually had an incident where a student on campus had been, uh, the university had found him guilty and expelled him. Of, of rape mm -hmm. um, so this is kind of so there was even some student pushback on that topic as well and the university and the admins were kind of worried well we don't want to be seen as a rape campus uh, I mean the stories were so powerful and mm -hmm. so important uh, but there was some restrictions that were put on those stories and and kind of tight reins mm -hmm. that were, didn't quite like we weren't allowed to put those stories on our website um, they printed like maybe 250, 300 books, and then those are those are gone now. Who knows where we have one, right? Mm -hmm. um, so those stories didn't get to kind of live on like we've seen another. Um, so you know, we we there's an abstract that you fill out when you're going for a facing project. So we kind of kind of filter a little bit about what we um, see in terms of we've had campuses apply for projects before that was almost like a uh, here's why we're so awesome in the community projects. It wasn't mm -hmm. so much about like how can we face a topic in this community? We're kind of like, well, we've tried to work with them to reframe that a little bit and help them out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we want to do a thing that's like uh, 
uh, racist or, you know, so we even have like the, the model of the titles often will be like, um, you know, facing immigration or, but if you put like facing immigrants, so that, that sounds, has this negative connotation to it. So we started to work like stories of immigration, a facing project and things like that. Um, but we, we definitely want to allow anything like that to go through um, mm -hmm. as a project. Yeah. The other thing too, and, and Kelsey alluded to this a little bit, we've had some colleges or universities put forward abstracts to tell the stories of the history of their campus, um, not from a reconciliation point of view, but rather just about we're celebrating our 100th anniversary and we really want people to know about our campus. And while that's a great project, it doesn't necessarily fall in line with our mission. And so something like that would be a project we would steer them in a different direction and not necessarily work with us. Great, thank you. Um, JR, you mentioned a, a, a great list of examples for how the Facing project has created some sustainable, lots of sustainable impacts in communities. And I'm wondering if um, any of you want to address um, what the advocacy possibilities are around the Facing project, particularly when a lot of these topics are, um, while they're very uh, critically important for now, <laughs> there's a lot of these conversations that are happening now given our, our climate in this country, and, and how these projects may be able to be used in an advocacy role for legislators, decision makers, et cetera. If that's been done or if that's okay to do or you know, what, what the role this project could play in that would be. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we certainly have no issue with that because we see it being a powerful tool for advocacy. Um, I mentioned before in Atlanta, Georgia, they are using their stories as a way to advocate for policy change around um, sex workers and prosecution. Uh, the project actually in Virginia at Washington and Lee, the students who led that project, <laughs> mailed a copy of the book to their governor and their governor's wife actually responded directly back to the students uh, with a really nice letter to let them know that that is a, that that is a topic that's near and dear to her heart and that she had passed um, the book on to their Secretary of Education in the state of Virginia and had asked her to look into um, the policies on college campuses in Virginia as it pertains to sexual violence and rape. So uh, to us, we saw that as a, a huge win. And I think there are many more stories like that um, about how these narratives can be used to help change not only minds and perspectives, but policies in our communities and in our states. There was an event in uh, Uni College, Kentucky, that um, that they invited some of the local politicians and state national level politicians, and Mitch McConnell came to that. So he was like sitting in the audience, and Jr. went to that, and he had a chance of, of ten minutes to talk and Mitch McConnell to, to listen, right? But it was I was but, very friendly. But you know that's what we see is like if you start with these stories regardless of your politics or ideology, it's like the starting point. So often we start with the politics of it, and then that's not an entry point, it's just division right mm -hmm. off the bat. So yeah. um, I think, yeah, and the thing I will say on that, um, and this is me speaking as J.R. Jameson, uh, politically I lean pretty liberal, and I think most people, if you know Mitch McConnell, would know that he's the exact opposite of me. But the reason why we were at that event together on the panel was to discuss addiction, a facing <laughs> project that happened um, in Kentucky. And so if stories can bring Mitch McConnell and me together on a panel to have civil discussions about addictions through first-person stories, then I think that's a huge win. I would agree with that. <laughs> um, at the campus level, um, can you guys share what your experience has been with the Facing Project, not so much the outcome of it, but the process as a tool for outreach and student engagement? So like, how have you been able to connect either your department or your program or your student groups with um, maybe likely or unlikely allies and new partners at your institutions through this program? Yeah, I, I would love to hear from maybe Deborah and Garima and Tiana about that first before we can respond to that. Who wants to go first? <laughs> go ahead, Tiana, that's fine. Okay, yeah. Um, 
You know, we've made a lot of kind of unlovely partners. We did a lot of emailing in the very beginning and I'm trying to think of like a specific example. Grima, do you have a specific example that like you can think of the top of your head? I'm not um, sure. That was a while ago. Yeah, no, it was. Yeah. Um, I think more than just like a specific group, I think it was just a variety of students from all over campus coming together. I think when you think of a writing project, yeah, you think like of just, you know, humanities majors or, you know, English majors yeah. um, just really coming together. But I found that this project connects people who are STEM, people who are engineering, like people who are from all over campus, um, and they're all able to come together. And I think that that's a really amazing part of this project is that it makes people interact from all different parts of campus that I don't think that they would have interacted with without this project. Um, and I think it shows that story, like through stories, we're able to connect with each other on deeper levels. That's more just than just the service levels of like what department you're in or like where do you live and all that kind of stuff. I think that's really the most powerful part about um, kind of the project and especially because at UCLA we're quite a large institution. Um, I think we have, is it 20,000 undergrads? 26,000. Yeah, yeah, 26,000. Um, and so I definitely met people I would have met any other way, but you're able to kind of build this deep connection, even though you only meet with them like four times before you share their story. Um, you connect with them on a much deeper level than I think I would have if I was just passing them by. Yeah. And with that, we just kind of did a lot of outreach everywhere, as many places as we could possibly get out on campus. We went and presented in different classes. We reached out to different organizations. We kind of made a wide approach just so we could connect different types of people around campus. Okay, thank you. At the University of Northern Colorado, as um, I kind of alluded to in our presentation, because it was the Office of Engagement that uh, applied for the technical grant and uh, support, then in some ways the onus of responsibility we felt was on us to make those connections between students and faculty and community partners. Again, I become, I'm becoming, I think, a believer of serendipity. At the same time, pretty much in our community, and I sit and serve on, um, our local university district is kind of a variation of a town gown committee. Uh, the city of Greeley was in the completion stages of a um, basically an oral histories stage performance called Do Tell, where they had key figures from the community telling their stories on stage in uh, an oral presentation. There was no um, published uh, written version of these stories, but I believe there's a video out there. Uh, so what we did when we knew that we had received support for this project was to go back to our folks at the city of Greeley and ask for support with uh, basically distribution lists and names of people that they had initially contacted. They reported out on, I think, eight stories or so, but they'd obviously selected those storytellers from a much larger part participant pool. So that was one of our kind of key sources. And I know that the faculty involved was kind of relieved that we were able to make those connections and bridge students with community partners. Um, we've also worked to develop connections across campus. While yes, we wanna go out into the community, students have also been working with different entities on campus. So from our development office, from our honors and scholars program, from our media team. Um, so they're making some connections there. And Tyler's just gonna share a little bit about the students in the class, because although it's an anthropology class, I think it's fairly cross-disciplinary. And yeah, with our two semester timeline, uh, first semester, obviously we're starting to get out about the project and then coming into this spring, um, it being an interdisciplinary course about event planning um, and storytelling, we were adamant about not advertising it just as an anthropology class. And so that allowed a lot of folks from, a lot of students from the fall course to get the word out into their departments about what's gonna be happening this spring. It offered a lot of, uh, a lot of different interaction, which really, really worked out for us, excuse me. Yeah, and I, yeah, I was just gonna say, I think again, um, and we'll hear what we learn in the student reflections and the ultimate debriefing, but at least up until now, I mean, all community engaged learning is about encouraging students not just to engage in mutually beneficial projects and learn from community partners, but 
really to help them feel that they are applying both disciplinary knowledge and developing those professional and practical capabilities that will um, help them develop as young professionals and a sense of accomplishment and having a tangible project product, which is something I saw in my own um, work as well with undergrads and uh, high school students, a, a tangible product, product, which is the book and the book launch and the book reading really does become kind of symbolic for mm -hmm. what this work is. And it's, it's not just a product that's a term paper that's submitted to a professor who will hopefully read it, but it's a product that's going to be read by a much broader, authentic audience. And I think all of those aspects come together to make the work very meaningful and powerful for our undergraduate students. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one more question and one just came in from participants. So um, particularly, and I'm not sure exactly which groups of students either at UNC or UCLA were, are most likely to participate in the Facing Project, but the question is, um, for commuter students who may have a, a different set of responsibilities and different time restrictions, family, school, work, whatever that is, were there um, kind of specific considerations that you all took in, in to, into mind when working with different groups of students or how did you structure it so that it could be sort of most inclusive for the students that you're trying to work with? for either campus or JR or whoever would like to jump in and then we'll wrap up. Um, I'm going to just jump in with a, a short answer that I understand to be the situation with the course on our campus. So a lot of how do you handle those logistics and time commitment and time involvement from students? Um, we are historically a commuter campus, although we have now um, turn some of that around. But I know that the faculty who is leading the project, Trish, was adamant that students understand that participation and their commitment and ability to deliver is crucial to the class and the course success. And she established that from day one. The other piece of this is that this particular course is listed and registered. And when students enroll, it's a three hour face to face course. So they have three hours of what would in essence be required time where they should be attending class sessions. But in some ways the faculty has taken on a kind of a semi flipped approach to the classroom. So some of those pre established three hour blocks of time where class would meet groups are permitted to go into the field to meet with community partners to uh, visit different sites to gather images or meet with whoever they need to to advance the overall project of the class and then some of the let's say more lecture or traditional discussion work that might have happened in classroom is happening through our learning management platform kind of offline in a remote system so it requires I think thinking differently about seat time and, in, and how we engage students and alternative kind of pedagogical approaches to the way we deliver instruction. That's at least our experience at UNC so far. Uh, for us, it was less involvement in terms of a class. Yep. Bummer. Sometimes technology is not our friend indeed. Um, it looks like we just lost her. Tiana, is there anything else you'd like to pitch in from UCLA? You don't have to. Yeah, um, really, we had a lot of uh, commuter students were part of our project. Our kind of our project is a little bit different, though, because we had club meetings. Um, but in addition to that, we also had writer storyteller pairings, and they kind of met whenever they wanted to. We tried to be very commuter friendly. Um, we actually had one of our editors also a commuter. Um, and so she would just kind of message in whenever we were having our meetings. Um, but we really focused on a lot of accessibility. Um, and so we were very flexible with, you know, if you're a community student, we often paired community students together as writers and storytellers so they could meet in central locations. Um, but we have a little bit of different structure because we don't have class. So I'm not sure if that was helpful, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Thank yeah. you. Um, so we are a couple minutes actually beyond our Q&A time, but JR and Kelsey, I wanted to give you an opportunity if there's anything else you'd like to share and then we'll say adieu for the day. 
<laughs> well, the only other piece I was going to add to that is because most spacing projects involve stories that are off campus. It's easier for commuter students in many ways to connect with their storytellers. Um, and I would say sometimes it might be harder for those traditional students who are living on campus to find the way out into the community. Um, so I would just kind of add that flavor to it. Um, what I would say though is, and we lay this out in our toolkit and we do this in the training with all of our communities, um, is to really think about those neutral spaces. And sometimes that's not on campus. Uh, to meet with the storyteller, but there may be an opportunity for the storytellers to come on campus. So you really have to look at your culture of your overall community and campus, and then also think about the student population you're working with. Um, we're excited that all of you took the time to listen to us talk about this. I appreciate our co-presenters who provided their knowledge and who are so brave enough, as Kelsey mentioned, to believe in this model, to take it on, to take that risk, um, and, and to see the rewards that are paying off in each of your communities. So I really appreciate you doing that. Uh, we would love to work with other campuses. If you're interested, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, at howdy at facingproject.com. For the campus compact state offices we are working with, you'll get information from your state directors in the coming weeks about participating in the project for next academic year. Great, thank you guys so much. It's lovely to see all of your faces and thanks for being here to share information with everyone who's on the call and um, who will be watching this webinar afterwards. Uh, we'll be sending out a link to the recording, so feel free to please share this information with folks at your institutions and, um, and within your communities if it's something that sounds like it's a good fit for, for you and your partners. Thank you all very much and thank you Piper for uh, the platform. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Bye.